country in the world, Kilimanjaro in Tanzania. And first of all, I would give you, I would like to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk to you about today. So I would like to start with a general introduction. Then I would like to talk about the patterns and drivers of mammal and dung beetle diversity. Afterwards, I would like to discuss ecosystem services provided by dung beetles before ending with a general discussion. Let's start with a general introduction. So biologists have been fascinated with the uneven distribution of biodiversity around the globe since the time of Darwin, Wallace and Alexander von Humboldt. And probably the most pervasive pattern in biodiversity is a latitudinal gradient in richness with elevated richness in the tropics and decreasing richness towards the poles. And here you can see the latitudinal gradient in mammal richness as an example. Even though the latitudinal gradient in diversity belongs to one of the best discrete patterns in ecology, the mechanisms behind this pattern are controversial until today, and many hypotheses have been proposed to explain this pattern in diversity. And elevational gradients among mountains are model systems to study broad scale patterns of biodiversity. And because of their limited spatial extents, the many separate ranges worldwide, and the uniformity of change in abiotic factors with elevation, mountains offer many opportunities for hypothesis testing. And today, I would like to take you on the extension elevation and gradient of Mount Kilimanjaro. And first, I would like to introduce you to my study organisms. So I was interested in ectothermic and endothermic diversity and how patterns and drivers may differ between those two groups. So as endothermic organisms, I chose mammals. As, and as ectothermic organisms, I chose dung beetles. And those two groups may appear to be very dissimilar, yet they are closely functionally related because mammals produce dung which is used as a food and nesting resource by dung beetles. Mammals are of huge functional importance in ecosystems and they provide ecosystem services such as seed dispersal, pollination. They're central for, for nutrient cycling and energy flow. And they're also, for example, important for the maintenance of habitat heterogeneity through herbivory, for example. Dung beetles are closely linked to mammals since they are closely coprophagous, and this means they feed on a microorganism rich liquid component of mammalian dung, and they use the more fibrous material to brood their larvae. And through their feeding and nesting behaviors, dung beetles contribute to a suit of important ecosystem functions and services. So dung beetles play a, peak, play, play a key role in dung removal and nutrient cycling, and especially tunneler dung beetles are important for bioturbation because they move large quantities of earth to the soil surface during nesting. And the role of dung beetles in dung removal and nutrient cycling has been linked to increases in plant biomass and the effect of nutrient mobilization of dung beetles on plant growth rivals that of chemical fertilizers. And through their activity, and their breeding and nesting behavior, dung beetles suppress macro and micro invertebrate parasites. And finally, they are also known as secondary seed dispersers. And the most particular biological feature of dung, beetle is their, dung beetles is their breeding behavior. And according to their breeding behavior, they can be divided into three behavioral or functional groups. And those two groups those three groups are first the dwellers or endocarpids, and those are the most primitive of dung beetles as regards the breeding behavior. And they nest directly in the dung and eat their way through the dung. And mostly they don't construct any broad chambers for their brood. Whereas tunneler dung beetles dig more or less vertical tunnels below the dung pad, where they transport dung into those burrows and those burrows and then the dung in those burrows can be used for feeding and breeding. And then there are the roller dung beetles who evolved the ultimate dung beetle skill of rolling a dung ball. And this is a transportable resource. And they transport this ball for a longer, shorter distance before burying it into a suitable spot in the ground. And there's also a fourth group of dung beetles, which is called kleptoparasites. It's a specialized group and they parasitize the nests of tunnelers and roller dung beetles. 
esperamos. To introduce the study organisms, and next I would introduce you, I would like to introduce you to the factors which might influence mammal and dung beetle richness, and I would like to start by mammal richness. Source availability is often considered the major driver of animal diversity, and under the resource, the resource availability hypothesis states that energy limits the occurrence of species, and that more productive ecosystems can harbor more and larger populations than less productive ecosystems. And primary productivity is often taken as a proxy for energy or resources. And under the resource availability hypothesis, we expect to see a positive impact on mammal richness. And in these diagrams, you will see in blue positive relationships and in red negative relationships. Okay, what's that? So we thought that primary productivity is mainly impacted by temperature and precipita precipitation. We also expected to see a positive impact of temperature on mammal richness. And this I call the temperature speciation hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that temperature limits the occurrence of species due to physiological constraints and by accelerating ecological and evolutionary rates. Then Oh, sorry. What's going on? Now it's working. Then there's the water availability hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that water limits the occurrence of species either due to direct dependencies of water or via indirect energy related effects. So we also considered the area effect, and the area effect states that larger areas can sustain more populations than smaller areas. And this is why, because Mount Kilimanjaro is a conical mountain, we expected to see a negative impact of increasing elevation, that is decreasing area on wild, wild mammal richness. Then we also looked at land use, and we expected land use to exert negative impacts on wild mammals as well as on primary productivity. Then we also looked at domesticated mammals and we expected that domesticated mammals have a negative impact on wild mammals because to, because to um, factors like they share the same habitat or they may even, um, they may even distribute diseases to wild mammal richness. And we expected domesticated mammals to be impacted by primary productivity as well as by a positive impact of land use because domestic mammals are mostly found in anthropogenic habitats. Then we also looked at the protection status of study plots and we expected that especially larger mammals are more dominant in protected habitats than in unprotected habitats because in anthropogenic habitats, especially large mammals are vulnerable to hunting and disturbance. And we expected protection to have a negative impact on domesticated mammals. And this is the whole path diagram showing all the factors we considered for mammal diversity. And now I would like to move to dung beetle diversity. And for dung beetles, because dung beetles depend on mammalian dung resources as a food and nesting resource, we tried to measure the dung occurrence for dung beetles on Mount Kilimanjaro in the field. And for this, we estimated mammal defecation rates. And again, under the resource availability hypothesis, we expected to see a positive impact of mammalian dung resources, which is mediated by net primary productivity on dung beetle richness via dung beetle abundance. Primary productivity is again impacted by temperature and precipitation. And we expected to see a positive direct effect of temperature on dung beetles via the temperature speciation hypothesis. And we also expected to see a positive impact of temperature on mammalian dung resources. Then for ectothermic organisms, there may be a second temperature hypothesis. And this hypothesis is called the temperature mediated resource exploitation hypothesis. And this hypothesis states that temperature limits the amount of resources that can be exploited by ectothermic organisms. And this means the dung beetle foraging activity and the net energy gain is higher under warm temperatures as compared to cold temperatures. And under this hypothesis, we expect to see an indirect effect 
of temperature on dung beetle richness mediated via dung beetle abundances. Again, we expected to see a positive impact of water availability on dung beetle richness and a positive impact on the resources. And, and we also considered the area effect. And here again, we expected to see a negative impact of increasing elevation on dung beetle richness and on mammalian dung resources. And finally, finally we also looked at land use and we expected land use to exert negative impacts on the dung beetle community as well as on the resources and primary productivity. And these are all the factors that we considered for dung beetle richness. For my study, I used the 66 study sites selected on the Kili project on Mount Kilimanjaro. And Mount Kilimanjaro rises from 700 meters to 5,895 meters. And those study sites are located on the southern slopes of the mountain and they represent the 13 primary ecosystem types that can be found on Mount Kilimanjaro. And those are composed of seven anthropogenic and six natural habitats. And on Mount Kilimanjaro, all habitats below this line are unprotected with the exception of two savanna study sites in a nature reserve. And all habitats above 1,800 meters are protected inside Mount Kilimanjaro National Park. And both inside and outside the park, we can find natural habitats, such as savanna habitats outside the park, and forest plots inside the park, just, such as here Okotea Forest, which are natural plots. And then we can also see anthropogenic habitats, such as maize fields outside of the park, but there are also anthropogenic habitats inside Mount Kilimanjaro National Park. And these are disturbed, hobby, disturbed forest habitats, such as Podocarpus Forest which is disturbed on this plot due to logging. With this, I would like to move to mammals and their patterns and drivers of richness. And the title of this chapter is Primary Productivity and Habitat Protection, Predict Elevation and Species Richness and Community Biomass of Large Mammals on Mount Kilimanjaro. For recording mammals, I used camera traps. And I put five camera traps on each of those 66 study sites. And I left them in the field of a duration of a fortnight, so 14 days. So this amounts to 70 trap nights for each plot. And trap nights is the common unit when working with camera traps. And with this method, I set the cameras to collect videos. And with this method, I collected around 80,000 videos. But those videos did not necessarily show mammals, but moving grass especially in the savanna, because those, those cameras are very sensitive to movement and they trigger really at the slightest movement, which is good, but it was bad in the savanna because there was a lot of wind. And in total, I collected around 1,600 videos that actually did show mammals. And those videos showed a total of 38 mammal species, of which 33 were wild mammals and five were domesticated mammals. And here you can see the pattern of mammal richness and mammal community biomass that we found. I can't really cope with this uh, pointer, so I will just try to explain it like this. So for both species richness and total biomass, we found a unimodal pattern with elevation. And in orange, you can see anthrogenic habitats and in blue, natural habitats. And there was no difference between anthrogenic and natural habitats for both species richness and biomass. And this pattern closely mirrors the pattern of primary productivity on Mount Kilimanjaro. However, if we only looked at protected habitats, we found that both species richness and biomass increased at low elevations. And this you can see with this blue dashed line. And this might be due to the, due to the fact that at low elevations, mammal richness and biomass is restricted due to human impacts and only in protected habitats, large mammals can be sustained. When we look at the factors driving mammal richness, we found that the major driver of animal richness was primary productivity under the resource availability hypothesis. And we also found a positive impact of protection on wild mammals. 
And we also did find a positive impact of domesticated mammals on white mammals. This actually we didn't expect. We wanted to see a negative relationship here. But this may be because many omnivorous white mammals were also found in the cultivated zone where also most domesticated mammals occur. And then we also saw an impact of temperature on white mammal richness. So to sum up this chapter, species richness and community biomass of white mammals showed a unimodal distribution with elevation. But if we only check protected habitats, this pattern shifted to a low plateau for species richness and even to a pattern of decreasing biomass. And as the drivers of diversity, I could show that the resource availability hypothesis, protection status of study plots, domestic mammals, as well as temperature speciation hypothesis all played a role. So there are many factors together influencing richness. And I could also show that protected areas are vital for the conservation of large mammals. So, and now before moving on to the dung beetles, I would like to show you a video of some of the mammals we found. And I would like to take this opportunity to tell you a little bit about their ecology. And in those videos, you will see on top the code for each study site, as well as the elevation where the video was shot. So the biggest highlight that we found was the Abbott Stiker. And this species is so spe special because this antelope is endemic to Tanzania and it's listed as endangered in the IUCN red list. And you can see it's a glossy nearly black diker, and they also have a prominent crest of reddish hair between the horns. And they're restricted to a few mountains in South and East Tanzania and North Tanzania. And interestingly, the first photograph of the species was taken in 2003. And the first videos were taken in 2013 from the Udzungwa Mountains, which are located in East Tanzania. And those are the first videos of the species of Mount Kilimanjaro. And until now, little was known about the distribution of the species on Mount Kilimanjaro. And now, since we encountered the Abbott Stiker throughout the national park from 1,900 up to more than 3,800 meters, we can say that Mount Kilimanjaro is probably another stronghold of this species. And this is the first video ever of an Abbott Stiker pair. And here you can see a male trying to mate, but I'm not sure whether this worked out or not. And then you move on to the lesser kudu. This is one of our, of our nicest night shots. And here you can see those white markings on neck and throat. And those are characteristic features of the species. And lesser kudus belong to the spiral horned bovids and the males carry horns. And they are adapted to deciduous bushland and thicket, so we often met them in the savanna, in those protected habitats. And they are browsers, that means they eat leaves and green stem and bark from plants in contrast to grazers who clip vegetation at or near ground level. And here you could just see a female leaving, followed by a young lesser kudu. And the bush pick is nocturnal and they occur on Mount Kilimanjaro up to an elevation of 4,000 meters. And they communicate mainly through scent and sound. And they are covered in coarse shaggy hair. And here you can see a male bush pick. You can even see it short and inconspicuous yet rather sharp tasks. And yeah. They occur in groups of so-called sounders of up to 12 individuals. And here you can see such a sounder in the background. And the crested porcupine is a rodent and it's covered in black and white spines and it has a prominent crest of elongated spiny hair from head to shoulders. And it's a solitary forager, but they live in small family groups consisting of adults pairs and they're young, and here you can see an adult pair.
I decided to include the East Country Hyrex because the East Country Hyrex has a very interesting phylogeny. And here you can see the East Century Hyrex. So it's a very small, cute creature. Oh shit, sorry, that was unintentional. Let's go back. I will try to, to put the video to the right direction because there are really still nice things to see. Really sorry about this. Let's move a little bit, yeah. Okay. So the East Century Hyrex belongs to a clade of mammals called Afrotheria. And the Afrotheria are clades of mammals, a clade of mammals with African origin. And one very famous member of the Afrotheria is the elephant. So this small creature is related to elephants. So you wouldn't expect this at first sight. And then we also have the honey badger or rattle. And this is a carnivore, but an omnivorous feeder, and they are known to raid honeycombs. So that is where the name come from, come from, comes from. And then the African civet belongs to the Feliformia, which are cats and related species. And this species is very well adapted to cultivation. So this may be one of the omnivorous species we found in the same habitats as the domesticated mammals. As well as the next species, the large spotted genet. This species is also very well adapted to cultivation. And here we filmed the genet on a coffee plantation. And they're very elegant and long bodied creatures. And they're also called rat like leopards. Now you know why. Then the serval was also an highlight. And this is a tall spotted cat with a shortish tail. And here you can see a serval while it's producing dung for dung beetles. So very important for our study to have this video. And the servals, interestingly, have the longest legs of all cats. And these legs are mainly not used for hunt for, for running, but they're used to gain elevation in high grass because they like to hunt small rodents. And servals occur from the grass savanna up to the montane zone, and they like habitats consisting of a mosaic of woodland, glades, and moorland. And we filmed the serval from 2,400 up to over 3,800 meters. And the next video shows something quite special, which is a melanic serval. So this is a serval which is completely black. And melanism is often associated with montane Pleistocene refugia. And these are not so common on Monkey Manchao, so something very special. Then the leopard. So we did catch a video of a leopard, unfortunately, just at the base of the mountain on a maize field. And I actually wanted to catch a video of a leopard high up the mountain because in 1926, a leopard carcass was found at 5,600 meters. And this carcass was made famous in Hemingway's Nose of Kilimanjaro. Unfortunately, I could not get videos of leopards that high up. This was a shame, but not quite as spectacular, but we could at least find leopard dung high, off, high up the mountain. So this was also a little success. Then we move on to the primates and here to the yellow baboon. And yellow baboons live in complex mixed gender groups of up to 200 individuals. And here you can see the behavior when they move as a group and then males lead and females and their young stay safe in the middle and less dominant males spring up the rear. And female and young, young baboons like to be carried by their mom. And that you can see in the background. And then we come to the blue monkey and the subspecies occurring on Mount Kilimanjaro is called Zanzibar Sykes monkey. And those species are extremely common throughout the forest. So we encountered them many, many, many times. And they also live in social groups, but in smaller groups consisting of females, their offspring and a single male. And due to their behavior, their diet and their broad extensive range, 
They belong to the most common and generalized of all arboreal forest monkey species. And then I would like to end this video with a Kilimanjaro black and white colobus. And this species is characterized by the tail, which is white from the base. And this species is thought to be endemic on Mount Kilimanjaro and Mount Meru. And it has been hunted for its coat in the past, and this may sporadically still occur. So this was the fun part. So now it gets serious again with the dung beetles. And now we will talk to you about the dung beetles. And this chapter is called Climate Rather Than Dung Resources, Predict Dung Beetle Abundance and Diversity Along Elevational and Land Use Gradients on Mount Kilimanjaro. So for collecting dung beetles, we used baited pitfall traps, and we used both human and cow dung baited traps. And this may seem to be a little bit gross. But human dung is, in fact, the best method to collect dung beetles because we are omnivorous. So we collect the whole range of dung beetles in high numbers. And if you catch with other traps like cow dung baited traps, you also get actually the same community, but in smaller numbers. And you need a huge amount of dung. So we needed 700 grams for each cow dung trap, which was quite a lot when you consider 66 study sites. And I collect a total of 10,400 dung beetles. And here you can see part of the collection. And those are distributed in over 130 species and 50 genera. When we look at the patterns of dung beetle richness on Mount Kilimanjaro, we see that the species richness decreased with elevation, whereas abundance showed a unimodal pattern with elevation. And when looking at the whole dung beetle community, there was no difference between anthropogenic and natural habitats. But as I introduced you to the different functional groups of dung beetles before, at the top you can see the tunnelers, then the rollers, the dwellers, and the kleptoparasites at the bottom. And interestingly, when we look at functional gifts of dung beetles, there are differences. For example, with the roller dung beetle, we see that there are at that there's a higher species richness in natural habitats. And this may be due to the fact that large dung, that roller dung beetles are mostly large bodied species and also dig shallower nests than tunneler species. So they might be more vulnerable to, to high temperatures, which are common in anthropogenic habitats. And the pattern of dweller rich, and yeah, in this same pattern you can see for abundance. Interestingly, dweller dung beetles show a unimodal pattern with elevation. And this is so interesting because it actually mirrors the pattern along latitude, latitude for dung beetles. Because along latitude, tunneler and roller dung beetles who reach their highest diversity in the tropics are replaced by dweller dung beetles, which reach their highest diversity in temperate regions. And exactly the same pattern we can see along elevation where dweller dung beetles displays roller and tunnel dung beetles with increasing elevation. And the same you can see for abundance. When we look at the factors influencing dung beetle richness, we saw that the temperature speciation hypothesis explained most in together with the temperature mediated resource exploitation hypothesis so there are both direct and indirect effects of temperature explaining dung beetle richness. There was also a positive impact of water availability and dung beetle abundance was influenced by land use. Interestingly, I could not find an impact of mammalian dung resources on dung beetles, even though we really tried hard to measure dung accurately in the field. So along the huge elevation gradient of Mount Kilimanjaro, temperature seems to be more important. So to sum up this chapter, species richness of dung beetles decreased with increasing elevation, while abundance showed a unimodal distribution. And as patterns of diversity, I could show that the temperature speciation, as well as the temperature-mediated resource exploitation hypothesis explained most, together with the water availability hypothesis, and land use also played a role. 
However, there was no impact of resource availability on dung beetles. So with this, we come to the last chapter on dung beetles, which deals with dung beetle ecosystem services. This is called the correlative and experimental approach to dung decomposition by dung beetles. And dung beetles are model systems for biodiversity ecosystem function relationships. And this is because of the very cool resource they use, which is dung. So I hope I can convince you that dung is really cool and that it is worthwhile doing research on dung. And dung is a model system to study BAF relationships because dung occurs in ephemeral resource, resource patches and such patches are spatially delimited and they can be quantitatively manipulated, replicated, measured and sampled very easily. So it's perfect for doing biodiversity ecosystem function studies. And we did a dung removal experiment with three exclosures. So we wanted to find out what happens if we exclude either large dung beetles or the whole dung bee community and what effects this has on dung decomposition. So we had three treatments. We had open unmanipulated cow dung pads where the whole dung beetle community could access. Then we excluded large dung beetles so that only small dung beetles had access to the dung. And here you can also see the chulette of a fly and a microorganism. And this should symbolize other small decomposers which can access the dung. We also had a control treatment where we excluded the whole dung bee community to see what happens when dung is decomposed in the absence of dung beetles. And on each study plot, we randomized those three treatments and we put them in the corner of each plot, which was 50 times 50 meters square large. And we also wanted to collect the dung beetle community at the same time. So we also put a cow dung baited pitfall trap on each study plot. And after 15 days in the field, I collected the remaining dung and measured the weights, the dry weights in the lab. And we had different expectations for low and high elevations. So from our diversity study, we knew the dung beetles are most reach the highest species richness at low elevations. So we expected that at low elevations, dung decomposition is highest when the whole dung beetle community can access, that it will be reduced when large dung beetles are absent, and that there will hardly be any dung decomposition when the whole dung beetle community is excluded. Conversely, at high elevations, we expected to see hardly any differences between the three treatments because we knew that at high elevations, dung beetles are largely impoverished or even absent due to adverse climatic conditions. And I calculated dung decomposition by firstly calculating the dry weight of 700 gram cow dung pets, and this I call the control dry weight. And I calculated the difference between the control dry weights and the treatment dry weights, which I collected from the field. And I divided this by the control dry weight. And according to this equation, dung decomposition equals one if the whole dung was decomposed and it equals zero if no decomposition took place. And we are also interested in the factors driving dung decomposition. And here I expected dung beetle species richness and abundance to be highly correlated. And I expected dung beetles to exert a big positive effect on dung decomposition. And this I call the diversity hypothesis. Then we are also interested in body size traits of dung beetles. This is why we measure the body size and the community biomass of dung beetles. And I expected body size to be impacted by species richness and to impact biomass which is itself impacted by species richness and abundance. And we expected biomass and body size to have a positive impact on dung decomposition. And this I call the functional trait hypothesis. Then we also looked at temperature and we expected temperature to exert positive impacts on the dung beetle community, as well as on dung beetle functional traits and dung decomposition under the temperature hypothesis and the water availability hypothesis where we expected also positive impacts. Then we also looked at land use and there we expected to see negative effects on the dung bee community as well as on dung decomposition. And finally, we included the treatment in our models that is open dung, half open dung or closed dung and we expect the treatment to impact on the dung beetle community. 
And this is the whole path diagram. So when you look at dung decomposition along elevation, when the whole dung community could access, so in unmanipulated cow dung pads, we see that decomposition follows a hum-shaped pattern along elevation before leveling off at 3,000 meters. And this pattern closely resembles the pattern of, of dung beetle community biomass, as well as the pattern of dung beetle body size. So there appears to be a causal relationship between those two. And across treatments, we had different expectations for low and high elevations. And at low elevations, we found what we expected, that is the dung decomposition was highest when all dung beetles were present and was significantly reduced when large dung beetles or the whole dung bee community was absent. At high elevations, we also saw what we expected, that there's no difference between treatments. And when you look at the drivers of dung decomposition, I could show the dung beetle functional traits, that is body size and biomass of dung beetles had the highest importance for dung decomposition, so the functional trait hypothesis explained most. So to sum up this chapter, dung decomposition showed a unimodal pattern along elevation, and dung decomposition was highest when the whole dung bee community was present, and small dung beetles could not compensate for the absence of large dung beetles. And those two treatments point to the pivotal role of large dung beetles for dung decomposition. And this is critical because large dung beetles are also the most extinction prone species. And the extinction of large dung beetles may not only impact dung decomposition, but also other dung beetle mediated ecosystem services, such as seed dispersal or nutrient cycling. And the last treatment points to the importance of dung beetles in general for dung decomposition because there was hardly any dung decomposition when dung beetles were excluded. And I show that functional traits are the main drivers for dung decomposition. With this, I would like to end with a short discussion. So I could show that there are different drivers for endothermic and ectothermic organisms along the huge elevation gradient of Mount Kilimanjaro. And I showed that for mammals, primary productivity and temperature, as well as the protection status of study plot was very important. Whereas for dung beetles, the main factors were temperature and precipitation, and there was no impact of resource availability. I also showed that large dung beetles are the most important for dung decomposition and that functional traits of dung beetles are important to assess when assessing dung beetle ecosystem services because otherwise you can't see those effects. Then I could show that land use overall had no effect on dung beetle communities and mammal communities. However, there were idiosyncratic patterns when we looked at different functional guilds and also for mammals, you can see the top on the right hand side herbivores, then omnivores, and then carnivores. We can see, as for dung beetles, that there are different patterns when we consider different functional groups. And for mammals, we saw that herbivorous mammals showed indeed more a higher species richness in natural than compared to anthropogenic habitats. And this is most likely because most large mammals we found were actually herbivorous species, like the lesser kudu I showed you before. And for dung beetles, groups which show a specialized behavior showed the strongest response towards, towards land use change. And both land use and climate change are the most important threats for global biodiversity. And climate change may have different impacts on endothermic and ectothermic organisms. And while endothermic organisms are more buffered against temperature changes, for ectothermic organisms, this may be different. And I could show that there is a positive impact of temperature on dung beetle richness, but if temperatures increase, there might be negative effects, especially for large body dung beetles who could be pushed beyond their thermal limits, especially in anthropogenic habitats. And with this, I am at the end of my talk. And I would like to thank my two supervisors, Ingolf Stefan de Wente and Marcel Peters, for their support. 
But the biggest thank you goes to the people who did the hard work, and these were my field assistants. And they carried, for example, over 185 kilograms of cow dung up the mountain. This was a huge amount of work, so thank you for that. So without them, this project would have just failed. So yeah, I'm very indebted to them. Then I would like to thank the Tanzania National Park authorities for granting research permits. And I would like to thank the DFG and the DRD for funding. And of course, thank you for your attention. <laughs>